Okay, are we, are we on? Yeah. Okay. So welcome everybody to um, the Huddersfield Civic Society speaker event, the first ever online, as far as I'm aware. Um, as you probably possibly have read already, what we're going to do is have um, a presentation, which will actually be a um, presentation in the form of responses to questions that Lynette is going to put to Richard. Uh, and then when that's finished, which will be shortly, we hope before eight o'clock, we'll have half an hour for a Q&A where we hope you will um, come up with questions or questions and comments that we, we that's myself and Lynn, can use to take the, the discussion further. So, as I said earlier, I'm Chas Ball, board member on the Huddersfield Civic Society. Um, I live in the town. I spent 15 years working in sustainable transport, though none of it to do with cycling. I'm, I'm not a, I, I, I'm a sort of occasional cyclist. And I think the important thing about this meeting is you don't have to be a cyclist to be interested in cycling. I'm going to chair this meeting with the assistance of Lynette Evans from, uh, from uh, UK Cycling. Uh, she's manager of the programme to promote community cycling in the north of England and has recently appointed a colleague to cover West Yorkshire. Many of you will know she was the Kirklees Council cyc cycling officer, but she left in 2016. So told me she's a little bit rusty about what's actually happening here since she lives in Calderdale. Um, so, Lynette's going to interview Richard and help me select the question. So, I think it's best if I now introduce the speaker as well, get me out of the way. So, um, I noted five things to say about Richard Armitage, uh, all of them quite polite, I've known him quite a long time. Um, but he was born in Brighouse, HD postcode, and he lives in Tameside in Greater Manchester. He spent quite a lot of his formative life as a transport consultant, but I now describe him as a cycling entrepreneur in the sense that he runs uh, Manchester Bike Hire uh, and Last Mile Logistics and Bambino Cycling, uh, all of which operate actually just over the Manchester border in Salford. But he's also a founder of the European uh, Cycle Logistics Federation and that's an interesting, politically interesting, but that's exposed him to more aspects of cycling in countries as diverse as Austria and Sweden, as well as Netherlands and Germany, where we often get our best examples from. And finally, his, his claim to fame in this part of the world is that he is the independent chair of the West Yorkshire Ticketing Company. So he works quite closely with West Yorkshire Metro and the bus operators. And he can tell you a lot about uh, the M card, which certainly we use, uh, to, uh, cashless prepaid bus tickets. And um, really pleased you could come, Richard, although I know you're at home. <laughs> so, um, without. Hey, good evening. Good evening. Thank you very much. I'm going to try and share the screen now. And hopefully, you can tell me whether it's working. Can everybody yeah. see that? Is that working, everybody? Yeah, yeah, that's full screen. Okay, many thanks. Well, it's really excellent turnout tonight. And um, this is going to be an extremely short introduction. Um, I thought we'd, ought to, we'd, we'd commence by uh, examining the uh, headlines that are on the front of the Huddersfield Civic Society webpage. So I'm starting with preserving our heritage. And I was delighted when I scooted round the HCS website to find your close-up of a busy city street where you've superimposed the old on the new. And what do we find when we blow it up? That there we are, cycling is part of Huddersfield heritage. It's official. So, um, there we go. Now I think shaping our future is a, a lovely phrase actually, um, that HCS has adopted. Because it's not about control as such. It's actually about everybody having something to say, something to contribute. And as far as I'm concerned, cycling is part of our future. And in the left, I'm suggesting it's part of family life, of ordinary everyday living. And on the right, 
that it's also in the form of cargo bikes an efficient stylish and digitally integrated method of uh, reducing the adverse environmental impacts of our deliveries. And then finally, the third line on HCS website is taking pride in our town. And I certainly think that's where I'd take us from the headline of the session today of bike friendly living to um, think about a bike friendly town. So think about bike friendly living. And in fact, really people friendly living. Um, and I think the idea is that we're going to create towns and neighborhoods where we actually want to spend time together. And on the left, my assumption is that the person who's decorated this bike so wonderfully with their kitsch plastic flowers, um, they've done it for two reasons. One is so that they can spot their own bike when it's parked in a bike park in the Netherlands with 10,000 other bikes, but also because it's part of the culture and it's part of what they are. It's part of normal. And then on the right, I thought this was a wonderful photo. I think it's from uh, Tour de Yorkshire, the um, cycling event. And of course, it's in front of an iconic building, a very important iconic building in Huddersfield. So what are you going to take away from this event? Well, I'm going to throw in some thoughts from other towns and cities, some examples, and hopefully from that you will draw some lessons for yourself. I'm going to hint at things that might, you might want to include in your more ambitious cycling strategy for Huddersfield and South Kirklees. And actually, to be honest, it could all be applied to North Kirklees as well, hopefully. And then I want you to try and go away from here with your desire to deliver bike friendly actions enhanced so that you actually want to get on with it straight away, whether it's at work, for leisure or where you live. And on the left of here, I'm just saying, look, over in Manchester, we've done lots of doctor bike sessions and it all seems very obvious. You take a mobile bike repair workshop to a venue and you mend bikes all day. And it's great. But actually, what we've done is we've learned how to do it better. And so act, then check and evaluate. Make sure that you did it right. And if you didn't, you amend it so that next time when you repeat it, it's better. And I really do want to encourage that process. Now, finally, all the slides are going to be made available later. So on here are some web links and how to get hold of me should you wish to uh, do so. And with that happy note, I will close for the moment. Thank you. Thank you very Over much, you, Richard. Lynette. Okay. So, yeah, we're in very strange times um, in terms of COVID-19, but of course we've seen a real upsurge in cycling. Um, and uh, certainly through Cycling UK's Big Bike Revival programme, people can't seem to fix bikes quick enough or loan bikes out quick enough to the for the demand. Um, so that's great, but we've, um, we've got to look at sort of going forward. Um, a lot of people would say that that Huddersfield um, is not, you know, we haven't seen huge levels of cycling in the past, that we're potentially pro probably starting from quite a low base. Some people say that we're too hilly an area, being in the South Pennines, for a lot of people to take up cycling. Um, and some people say that um, there's just too much traffic and we've got the ring road surrounding the town. Can you show us examples of towns that can inspire us to, to, to believe that we can? can raise the cycling levels um, uh, and, and really develop Huddersfield as a, as a cycling town. I'll do my best, but I've just temporarily lost my cursor. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I hope I've done it right there. Can you see that? Yeah, we've got yeah. that on the screen. Thank you. I, I apologize for that uh, glitch there. I think the question's terrific, isn't it? You know, is Huddersfield too hilly? But let's, let's just worry about the base from which we're starting. And my response to that is that everywhere starts from a low base, and there's no shame in that. It's whether you start or not that's the issue. Don't forget that in the Netherlands, by the late 1960s and the early 1970s, their cycling rates were beginning to tail off. They were plummeting in some parts. And then they were getting cars blocking up the center of towns. 
So the Dutch held a huge, huge debate, which is actually very well documented. It was led mainly by uh, parents, mainly women. And it was really very, very fierce debate. And what they decided was that cars were no longer going to be allowed to dominate the center of towns and that actually cycling needed to be prioritized and that they weren't going to let cycling rates plummet any further. So once that decision was made, since the early 1970s, the Dutch have invested and continued to invest in cycling and cycling infrastructure with all party support. So here in Huddersfield, you've got long valleys that carry the rivers and the canals. You've got former railway routes. There are more gentle inclines like the roads up to the hospital in Lindley and in Ainley Top. But the thing is that the cycling links between the radial routes running out of Huddersfield and the town centre itself are, however, absent at the moment. So first, I want to take you to a hilly town. If you want some hills in a city of 200,000 people, go here to Trondheim in Norway. Now, the interesting thing for me is that in summer, Trondheim experiences cycling modal share of 12%. Even in the depths of winter, it doesn't go below 4%. And one of the things they've done is they've actually inserted a ski tow, which can take you up this steep hill out of Trondheim to get on your way. And this has attracted a great deal of interest and allowed them to focus as a cycling town. And then they've built out from there. And if and as and when you get to look at the presentation. There's a link on here to a video of how it works. In San Sebastian in northern Spain, it's a coastal city of 90, 190,000. It too has got hills. In fact, it's invested heavily in creating what they describe as a more livable city. I like that word, livable. It includes restrictions on delivery times to central retailers, so the vans cannot come in the middle of the day when people are there. It's put residents' car parking underground in the middle of the city, so it's, the cars are no longer in view. It's uh, invested heavily in very good quality uh, cycling infrastructure, especially along the river. Um, and of course, it's now reaping the rewards. And here what you can see is it's vertical public transport. I love that phrase too, vertical public transport. What this is a moving ramps which allow people to walk with a shopping trolley or their bike up the near vertical hillsides to their homes. And back in Scotland, Edinburgh has some cracking hills. But in three wards in the middle, cycling to work is now 10% of all trips to work. So for some years now, a fixed percentage, which has gradually increased over time, of the council's highways budget has been allocated to cycling infrastructure maintenance and to new, new routes. So they really are cracking on with it. I don't think hills are actually a very serious impediment. It's all in the mind, you know. Most people go up steps all the time. And anyway, what's wrong with getting off and walking the bike? It's common sense for most people. If you get an e-bike, you can press the walk assist button to get low speed assistance walking your e-bike uphill or through narrow awkward spaces. By the way, coming downhill afterwards is your reward, of course. And then, of course, there's the weather. Terrible weather, it puts me off cycling. But I'm not convinced about that. I usually say to people that I get very, very wet once a year, and that's only because I gambled and assumed I would miss the, the rain. When my son went to live and work in Leiden in the Netherlands, we quickly learned that it rains a lot more there than it does here. It doesn't put people off cycling. Many Dutch cycling commuters simply ride with their brolly up. So I'm with Billy Connolly on this one. There's no such thing as bad weather, just the wrong clothes. Now let's just take a little wander round some of the um, other success stories and back nearer to home as well. There, by the way, is a picture of a walk assist on an electric bike computer and off you go. So in Brighton, they've got cycle contraflows on a back street here, and then they've got uh, on-road bike parking, park parking, and then they've got public bike shed. And uh, actually, 
we've also got an issue with enforcement in Brighton, haven't we? And FedEx, somebody needs to have a word with them. In uh, London Borough of Hackney, we've got rat running through residential areas has been stopped, but cycling has been increased because the cars can't go through the residential streets, but the bikes can. So they've now got 16.5% of adults cycling at least three times a week, and that was up to 2018, and it's risen since then. In Media City Salford Keys in Manchester, it's brand new. They've got no through route for vehicles. It's been built by private developer Peel Holdings, and they've got double-digit cycling-to-work rates that the BBC and ITV were. Finally, we can't leave worrying about a low base to start from without wondering what a high base looks like. If you were to go to Groningen in Northern Netherlands' vibrant regional economic center, three in five, that's 61% of all trips within a three kilometer radius around the city center are by bike. So I rest my case. Back to you, Lynette. Thank you, Richard. So we looked at some great high technology examples there of, of um, getting bikes up hills. Um, if we're looking at dedicated cycling infrastructure, what are your views on the benefits of off-road um, cycle routes away from traffic as compared to on-road facilities where there might be space reallocated for cycling and taking us away from vehicular traffic? Or do we need both to give people options choices yeah well i i i often hear people say that um i'm put off by the traffic on the roads and i i think i think before we look at the engineering which is important but before we do that let's just ponder for a moment what puts people off cycling on everyday journeys like you know getting to work or or going to the shops i think traffic's got two key components for someone on a bike the first one is the speed. Oops, wait a minute, I've got the wrong one here. Beg your pardon? I don't know what happened there. Hey, <laughs> all this new technology, very good. So the first one is the speed. When it comes to walking or cycling, 20 is plenty. This is a key decision for local highways authorities. If the traffic's going at 20 mile an hour or less, most cyclists, including the ones already out there, feel far more comfortable. And as soon as the traffic gets above 25 miles an hour, you start to get noise. It's mainly tires, but also engines. You get side winds. And if you're hit by a car doing 30 miles an hour, your likelihood of an injury or worse is, is, is very, very serious. Then I think there's proximity. How close is the traffic to you? The close pass is a nightmare for any person riding a bike and not just for the inexperienced. So why do I ride my bike at least one meter away from a parked car? Well, if you've never been doored by a vehicle, it's hard to convey how awful an experience it is. You've no warning and therefore you can often take no evasive action because there's no time. I mean, I once got doored by a car passenger which sent me off my bike into the bus queue standing at the side of the road in turn sending several of them flying. But today he's sharing screen at the moment. Yes, is it not there? No. Yeah, I beg your pardon. We will um, uh, uh, sort that out. We're watching you, person, talking head. Sorry about that. <clears throat> right, let's hit the button. And... How's that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I do beg your pardon. So I'm talking about proximity. So we've had speed and now we're talking about proximity. Um, West Midlands police have been leading the way in uh, tackling uh, close pass activity by drivers, mainly using cheap social media, but also uh, getting a lot of motorists to do the Dutch reach where you... Uh, open the door with the wrong hand in inverted commas and to keep one and a half meters from a bike. I can tell you more on that later if you wish. So to go back to your question now, you know, what do we do to make sure we sort out speed and proximity? Well, of course, one of the answers is uh, off-road traffic-free cycling. 
it's very enjoyable as you can see here and um it's great for leisure and fitness trips and for some off-road traffic free routes they're okay for um commuters as well but actually what people who are going to their gp or going to the shops or going into work what they want is not necessarily that kind of route they they want direct overlooked convenient routes that feel safe and i think that is the key reason why we need more dedicated cycling infrastructure with more of the road given over to walking and cycling i mean i really feel for highways engineers and town planners at this moment in time the way they've done things for years has just been rendered obsolete traffic speed and traffic props in proximity suddenly matter in a wholly different way to the one they've been dealing with it before and as soon as the traffic regularly exceeds 20 mile an hour on a key route well we need segregated cycle routes so that the cycling space is guaranteed and all the evidence suggests that if you build it then they will come i'm now going to try and show you a few slides of things going on elsewhere um, here's the lee busway in greater manchester dedicated recycled railway route with little guide wheels on the front of the buses to enable them to go up and down unhindered and along the side they needed an emergency access route obviously and they've turned it into a cycle route and a walking route as you can see this was very very early on you can see how new it all is so it was a little while ago but there's millions of people using that route now both by bus or by bike or on foot so this is an example of where the highways engineers and planners need to use their imagination now i'm going to take you to one of the biggest bike parks in the world next to Utrecht station in Netherlands. And here, you're actually looking at thousands and thousands and thousands of bikes uh, in store, securely, well lit, away from any nasty weather, um, and so on and so forth. This will feed into our discussion later about integrated transport, by the way, because this is next to the trains and the buses. Here we're on, um, uh, in London, on some of the new uh, cycle routes, um, build it and they will come. Uh, the volume of uh, cyclists on some of these routes is now almost too much. And I hasten to add, I'm not complaining. It just means that the issue of allocation of road space is even more acute. Um, so I think that I just want to end with one of the things that gets thrown at me, which is, well, it's all very well for you, but you know, um, uh, I, I can't actually push a pedal down because I've got something uh, wrong with my leg and so on. So a brief footnote, for people who find cycling difficult or impractical, for instance, they might have a mobility impairments or certain health conditions. Actually, there's still plenty for them in all of this. Cycling for all services are springing up all over the country, offering adapted bikes and trikes, and for some, people where this works this is a truly liberating experience and in Slowit, you have your own experienced community cic offering access to the countryside to people with mobility impairments and they recently even became a dealer for the ice ice recumbent electric assist assist trikes so um you've actually made a start anyway even if you weren't aware of that so i will close that now and if i can get my over to you, Lynette. Whilst I Thank you, Richard. With this. Yeah, um, we've got quite a few questions coming in, but I think we said um, we'd, we'd address those at the end. So if we go on for now. Um, so, yeah, so you, you've worked in, in Greater Manchester a number of years and setting up Manchester Bike Hire and so on. So, can you tell us some of the changes that impressed you across Greater Manchester um, and in getting places like Salford so, um, so successfully embracing cycling? Sure. Um, can you see the screen, first of all? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm going to major just on Salford. And the reason for this is Salford Council, which has sometimes been perceived rather unkindly, in my view, as the poor relation of its huge neighbour, Manchester City Council, has actually made significant investment in cycling infrastructure, and the rewards are now starting to come through. 
So I've already mentioned Media City and the Lowry and all that, where they're getting very high rates of cycling use. They've created a lot of completely usable, continuous, segregated cycle routes, and they've got many more to come through Greater Manchester's B lines or B routes. Greater Manchester, as some of you may know, has appointed a cycling and walking commissioner. The mayor has, by the way, who is the Olympic medalist and bike manufacturer, Chris Boardman. And the new cycling routes being implemented by his team, which are called colloquially the, the B lines, uh, which, by the way, is a nod to the industrious worker bee that is such a popular symbol in Manchester. And they've also been able to res respond to C19 with pop-up bike lanes. And here's some examples. So here's a Salford bike hanger. They've put quite a lot of those in where they're actually removing a space for a car or a van and replacing it with a bike hanger, which will obviously take a load of bikes. Here's the traffic-free row green loop line, 7.2 kilometers, opened in 2016. It links a string of important residential uh, populous well, residential areas, uh, all of which can uh, reach far down into Monton and onto Salford Royal Hospital very easily along NCN cycle, National Cycle Network route, NCN 55. Um, and as of last week on the A6, they put in this pop up cycle lane. It just went in overnight in response to C19. And it's a key route for cyclists. And suddenly we've got a viable, marked out, protected cycle lane. For me, they really get points for this. They've got off the mark and they've got on with it. Now, how did they go about doing it? Well, sure. Um, Peel Holdings is a very large company and it's got lots of resources. And Salford Council sensibly worked with Peel Holdings on Media City and its development. Um, but also they did things like what you're looking in front of you now, which was that they experimented with different ways of doing segregated cycle routes. Um, and they did things like that to try out and to learn things. And then they've done um, the classic thing of publicity and promotion, with, in this instance doing it together with Transport for Greater Manchester. Off the beaten track, it says, walking and cycling in Salford complete with a route. The row line is on there, like the row green line is on there, like I said. Um, the canal routes are on there and so on. This is all about education, information, promotion. And here you see them with their next B line that's going to be coming over on Trafford Road. This is going to be very interesting indeed when we see this in. One of the things they've done is they've followed consultation with visible action being taken. And that has built confidence so much so that we now have a very um, a lively and um, useful, I, I, you know, it's what you could say it was interesting, I think, but, but that's a bit of a neutral word, isn't it? Very useful cycling and walking forum, which meets about quarterly now. And um, the week before last, we met and there were 45 people on, including 12 councillors from Salford Council. Um, and it was a really, really intelligent exchange of information and knowledge uh, between all kinds of people who were from just ordinary punters, residents from Salford who'd cooked in, or they were campaigners, or they were planners, or they were elected members, or well, the people like me where I've got a bike shop in Salford. And um, it really was very interactive, informative and enjoyable. It's led by the walking and cycling champion. And he, he it is a he this year, it was a, a woman the year before, Councillor Jim Camel. And actually, um, he is very, very engaged with his task and takes it seriously, uh, albeit with very good humour. Um, and I think that this kind of thing is the way to build confidence and actually um, demonstrate that you're, you're, you're serious and for, you, for real. Finally, they've gone for every bit of external funding that they could find. But crucially, they've given their officers permission to get on with routing around for that money. Um, and they've appointed staff in its highway section who know what they're doing and are keen very keen to see 
the um, the cycling happening. Thank you. That's me, Lynette. Thank you, Richard. Yes. Um, so with a lot of children um, at home with their, with their homeschooling and perhaps getting out more on their bikes, um, how can you see that we can engage better with schools and make it possible for children to cycle more safely? Mm -hmm. Yes, well, that's um, <laughs> a, a very, very challenging thing, isn't it? So is the screen working? Yes. Yep. I'm well, beginning, it's not beginning to get the hang here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, first of all, a little caveat, because in practical terms, it's not an area of cycling promotion I've actually been closely involved with personally. But over the years, I've had plenty of opportunity to observe the good, the bad and indifferent levels of cycling environments at schools, including, by the way, at my own children's secondary school, um, uh, which was a very interesting experience. Um, I think that it's a strange thing, if I can just reflect on it, in that it seems so obvious. Once you look at these kind of uh, pictures, you just think, well, well why not? <laughs> what is it? What, what is it we're waiting for? <laughs> and so actually the obstacles are, must, are very, very serious and we have to take them seriously and we have to think very hard why the people we would like to change their behavior don't wish to do so and what we can do to help them uh, get rid of any obstacles, overcome any fears and things like that. So here's my list of things I, want, I would like to do. First of all, for me, every time, without a doubt, this is an institution, a school or a college, which is led from the front, from the top. That is, that is how it works. And so you must find out who the head teacher is and meet him or her and ditto the chair of governors. They need to be serious and persuaded if you're going to achieve anything at scale. I think that there's a strong role for the local authority. This is despite the arrival of academies. Um, actually, the highways is still the local authority's responsibility, academy or no. So the council needs to think about investment in the cycling and walking links to the school's main catchment areas. And this is investment is going to need to be done consistently over many years. Highways will find that there are parents and community leaders more than happy to help define where these safer routes either are and perhaps need uh, amelioration or can be for pupils wanting to walk to school or to college. I'm a firm believer in bikeability training. I think it should be universal. I also think it should be offered to parents and siblings who may be at other schools at that moment because actually um, families cycle together. So let's get them all going. I don't think... Richard. Yes. Richard, your slides went back. Yes, your that's all right. I haven't got any other slides. Slide. I just chose the favourite one. <laughs> Thank you. I'll leave it there now. Okay, sorry. Yeah, no, it's okay. okay. Uh, you're not sorry. missing any slides. Um, bikeability, for anybody who's not familiar, is not cycle proficiency mark two. It really is a very, very thorough and professional way to do it, which is, and I've done it myself to experience it right up to level three. And I thought, I thought it was very well thought through. I think we need bike loan schemes, especially for teachers, so that they can act as role models. I think we've got to encourage all school staff to ride to work at the same time as the pupils. And then pupils and parents can see an example being set. I think we need to forget about, oh, that's the way they travel. I think bikes need to be integrated into the curriculum at every point, whether it's doing maps and geography or whether it's um, uh, extracurricular activities. I mean, why wouldn't? the school football team cycle across town to play a match. I think you must have secure cycle storage for every bike that needs it, plus lockers large enough to cope with any kit associated with all weather cycling. In secondary education, let's forget about woodwork. Why not have cycle maintenance, wheel building and frame building instead, leading to bike refurbishment and maintenance exercise. And by the way, 
your local charity street bikes may well be able to help out there. They do a lot of refurbishment. In fact, they've been giving out bikes to NHS staff. And I certainly think back to the highways, car free areas can be established outside each school and where parents persist in creating a dangerous and overloaded school run, I think you've got to have a car exclusion zone at the drop off and at collection time. So I think there's a lot to be done there. And I also think there's, um, what should I say, quite a, a feeling of people wanting to do it. Thank you, Lynette. Thank you, Richard. Um, We've got a large number of, the, well, the council itself is a large employer and the new university and we've got other um, businesses in Huddersfield. Um, so working, you've referenced working with Peel Holdings in Salford. Um, can you give some more examples of how we might go about working with large institutions? Um, and perhaps bring it also some more examples from Manchester? Yes, and um, that is a terrific question because you, is the screen okay? Yes. Thank you. Oh, um, not yet. Oh. oh, it is now, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jazz. Um, yeah, I do, Lynette, want to share some direct experience in Greater Manchester over the last three years. But um, just to, to just think in terms of the how, how are we going to achieve higher cycli cycling rates? Well, the, f the first lesson of that is, is that one person on their own, forget it. One council on its own, forget it. One business on its own, forget it. But everybody figuring out how to work together on it, yes, that's, that's motive power. That, that is how to do it. And actually, in my experience, there are more and more employers and large organizations wanting to do this. So let's give you some example. I'm actually going to take something that was funded by Cycling UK's Big Bike Revival Scheme. Although I, I realised, Lynette, tonight you're here not in an official capacity, but thank you, Cycling UK, for that. Um, um, uh, so um, we've done a series in Manchester of outdoor bike events for transport for Greater Manchester. In your area, it's uh, West Yorkshire Combined Authority is the transport authority. And afterwards, what we did is we prepared for them a brief review for them to think about what to do next. So I want you to put on your hats that you imagine you're a transport authority and a highways authority, and you're thinking about these events that have just happened and what their impact was and whether you should think about doing more of them in the future. And this is what we said. We called it Awareness to Action. This is the, uh, those of you who are more familiar, this is famous behavior change psychology. And we've described to call it, they wanted to call it the triggering the switch to cycling. What is going to take people from being aware of bikes to actually getting on one on a regular basis? Well, first you need visibility, turning heads, changing minds. And um, we've got to get out there. This, this is not the sort of thing that is going to work unless people can see it and touch it. And uh, I, I, this question here, what does a bike look like? Uh, Actually, we want to shake people's views of what a bike looks like because the bike design side of things has changed beyond belief in the last 20 years and continues to do so. Some very, very clever people and engineers are producing some very good stuff. And what can you do using a bike? We challenge that. We can challenge that in everyday settings and we see outdoor bike events as delivering that. And what does visibility to do? You just look at the man on the picture on the left there. He, I didn't invent that pose, it's completely candid. He's turned and had a second take. God, blimey, what on earth's that? Ooh, I could put my young child in there, that'd be terrific. And then we've got to have the champions, the movers and shakers. So in the middle photo, we've got the new elected mayor of Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham, with our tours guide, John. And then over on the right, we've got a wide range of cargo bikes. In this instance, that was what this was promoting, so that they see different kinds of things for different use. And now if it'll work for me, a little cargo e-cargo bike smile. There, I hope you enjoyed that little uh, ride. And they certainly did. Um, in Ashton, we met Ali. He's... God, he's, he's um, on his way to work as it happens, but he just took five minutes out. 
and he saw our stand and he saw this bike, he had a garnet, he carried a heavy load, my colleague Pavel, on the front. And then he switched to uh, an e-bike that was more relevant for his likely needs and was completely bowled over by it. And there's plenty of hills in Ashton. Um, so it's a cargo bike and e-bike small smiles all around. He's had a good experience. He'll go and talk with his workmates and with his, fa his family and friends. Also, we've got to do some myth busting and confidence building and you do that with evidence and facts and figures. So the staff on hand have to be friendly, experienced, knowledgeable. Peter here clearly remembers the first time he rode this kind of new bike. He'd never ridden one before until two weeks earlier and what it took to get used to it so he can explain that to someone having a go. And people go, how much does it cost? And he knows, and it can carry, what, 180 kilos, including the rider? Wow. We've got to create these wow factors. And we've got to be able to answer people's questions. Can I store it at home? Well, actually, that one that Peter's holding will literally stand on its rear end safely, uh, vertically, so that it'll store in a hallway with the um, sticky out handlebars up in the air so you can walk underneath them. Um, am I gonna get wet? No, not if you get the right all weather gear. All these questions. And I think we do need finance and incentives. The e-cargo bike grant fund has just closed. I should have looked it up before I came online, but I don't think Kirkley's bid for this, but um, 58 councils did. They bid for 4.2 million pounds with the the funding to put in e-cargo bikes. Um, and that really impressed the Department of Transport, I can tell you. So you can see that there are all these things and finally show and try, see it, ride it sorted. So here we are showing this cleaner and um, street scene guy how one of these electric assist bike trailers works. Then we put his kit on and shortly afterwards, his manager turns up and has a go and sees it for himself. This is actually real time, real life, people doing it, experiencing it, it's unbeatable. And um, we've run a big cargo bike loan scheme in Manchester City Council. It's been very successful in getting this company to take on um, their lunchtime uh, classy sandwiches and soup delivery to office blocks and office workers in Man central Manchester doing it using a trailer and it's very, very efficient. And here's Lola Kobos, who works in the mailroom at Manchester Metropolitan University, showing off one of the cargo bikes she's been using. So um, that's that. But don't forget, um, during the C19 lockdown, just like uh, Millsbridge street charity street bikes, uh, my company, Manchester Bike Hire, got hire bikes out to NHS hospital staff rent-free to help them to get to work. So what I'm going to do now is just show you a very, very short set of slides advertising a new scheme of e-bike rental for, um, there we go. I'm sorry, I'm having a little problem with my screen there, but anyway. Um, we have done, here we go, this is good. So, um, pardon me. Right, so what we've done is that we've launched last Thursday, so this is hot off the press, an e-bike hire scheme for NHS staff in North Manchester, working with the NHS Trust there. This is the publicity they put together telling the staff what was on offer. And what it says is that you can have an electric assist pedal bike for free for four weeks. It includes locks and lights, full support and maintenance. If it breaks down, it gets replaced. Um, and all you gotta do is sign up. And after the free trial, you can carry on renting for 15 quid a week or less, depending on how long your hire is, which is less than the cost of a weekly bus ticket, or you can buy it either through the salary sacrifice cycle to work scheme or interest-free credit, or if you've got the cash, or you can just return it. There's no obligation, hand it back in, by the way, 
It's only been going a week, this scheme, and we've already got a waiting list, so we will be putting it straight out again if someone does hand it back, and off you go. It's all automated how they sign up online, so we've done it contactless. They just have to come in and pick the e-bike off, a big e-bike up from our shop, so that it can be fitted for them. And here's the NHS staff who are directly involved in this partnership, and we're working very, very closely together on all of this. Um, because it's Manchester Bike Hire, sorry, Chaz, no, okay, sorry, I thought, no, I thought this isn't on the screen at the moment, yeah, isn't it? I'm sorry, you should have shown, shown up earlier, you right? Might. Okay, I'm I will try one more time, uh, just to get it up very quickly. Um, Oh, man. No, it's no good. We're going to have to skip that one. Um, Can we, so yeah, anyway, just to finish off, what happens is that um, if this works, the idea is to expand it. It will be seen to reduce parking pressure at the hospitals because they've got enormous problems with parking, to actually enable staff to lead a healthier life and existence, um, and to actually do it on a, a, an economic basis. Um, and finally, here in Huddersfield, I would say that you've got significant untapped potential for cycling rates to be radically increased via your larger organisations and employers. To take one example, the University of Huddersfield with nearly 20,000 students enrolled, it is a key resource for cycling. In many cities, the student population has led the way on cycling. I mean, just look at Cambridge or Oxford or York and over at Leeds Beckett University, they actually employ a sustainable travel manager full time to make these things happen. I think getting the students on their bikes would be a great way to meet those targets of visibility that I mentioned earlier uh, and to get people going on their bikes. Thank you, Lynette. Thank you, Richard. Um, Charles says that the Huddersfield Civic Society is very keen on seeing better integration of travel modes. So cycling with, with um, trains, cycling with buses. Can you show examples of what it looks like when this is properly designed um, and encouraged, perhaps with particular reference to um, railway stations? Yes. And can you see the screen? Yes. Okay, sorry about this. Well, yes, and here in Huddersfield, you've got the fourth busiest station in Yorkshire, apparently, after Leeds, Sheffield and York. And what do you know? You've now got secure platform parking for bikes. Um, but what about outside the station? In the town rather than the railway side of the barriers? There's plenty of space outside. Can we build some secure bike parking there? And incidentally, there are plenty of examples where this has been done elegantly and in keeping with the vernacular. It doesn't have to look a mess. Um, so yes, I think there are some grand opportunities. What I'm gonna do now is finish very, very shortly with uh, just a few slides. Um, looking at things that are going on from elsewhere. I'm now in Leiden in the Netherlands and the bus and the bike perfectly in harmony. And you notice the barrier which is automated for the bus makes sure that the cars don't go through. And meanwhile there's loads of room for cyclists and small motorbikes to up, go up and down the outside. If you want to look at something more grandiose this is a main motorway running into Bruges, or past Bruges, I should say, in Belgium. And Hilda Krevitz, the uh, 2014 Flemish Minister for Mobility, she's um, doing a presentation and showing off this extraordinary high-level bridge for pedestrians and cyclists to ensure that they're not cut off from their communities and from walks in the nearby woods by the traffic and it really is quite amazing uh, uh, it's, it's, it's breathtaking in fact going back nearer to home this is Oxford Road in Manchester where we've got the bike lane going around the back of the bus stop and it's working uh, it's working very well uh, particularly as people learn to look out for each other and so on um, and that is a new segregated cycle route, the length of Oxford Road, past the university, uh, the swimming pool, 
the uh, computer center, the business school, uh, Metropolitan University, and so on and so forth, hospital. I've taken you to Bournemouth now. And again, they've, they've done their own version of going around the bus stop the wrong way for the cyclist. Very effective. Um, I'm in Bedford now. This is their famous so-called Dutch star roundabout, um, where they did have uh, all sorts of traffic flow problems. It's quite a few heavy lorries go through there and it's not easy for them to choose another route. And so what they've done is things like this, which are shared space for cyclists and pedestrians. You know, just quickly, you notice how wide the dotted lines are for the um, bikes and the pedestrian zebra to be shared there. And then you watch the red lorry as it goes round the um, roundabout and so on. Lots of room for all of it and it all flows perfectly. Bedford is not ground to a halt. Now I'm going to um, go through the next sequence without saying anything. Uh, the, visually, I, I recommend you watch the woman on the right cycling in the pale yellow t-shirt. You'll, you'll see her t-shirt as it moves down. So I should have taken a video if I'd been awake. I'm in uh, Leiden in the Netherlands, by the way. So I'll just do that again. So here she's with her mate cycling in to Leiden. This is a two-way cycle route, well away from the traffic. Um, there's also a pedestrian route on the side. It's all very clearly signed. The pink bit that they're on here implies that it has, that route has priority over motorized traffic. So they've just gone over a side road and the traffic approaching from either side, from either the main road or the side road, approaching that pink road has to stop for cyclists. They have priority. Here you can see the pink bit, which is priority when the cyclists' traffic lights are on green. And there they are, and off they go, and on their way. And it's all incredibly smooth. Um, I'm sure that that's more than enough from me for the moment, Lynette. And um, I hope that people have found it all very interesting. And I'm sure they've got their own interesting comments to add. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, there's lots of um, lots of comments coming in. So let's see how I manage this. Um, so one of the questions earlier is I suppose a call out to people. Does anybody here um, work for a Huddersfield employer that that has actually got electric bike charging points? Does anybody work anywhere that, that has those? I'd like to share that. And can I come in? Do, shall I come in with that? Because I, I do have some thoughts on this. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I'm sorry, I, I have not had time to look at who that was, whoever it was. Hello. Um, what I would say is that uh, if you're familiar with e-bikes, for most people on a commute, it will be very rare that they will need to charge their battery uh, during the day when they're at work. Um, because mm. the batteries usually last at least 40 miles and most people aren't commuting more than 20 miles each way. Yeah. Um, so um, to be honest with you, e-bike battery charging is a bit of a red herring, but I'll tell you where it isn't a red herring. And you know those bike hangers I showed in Salford. Now, yes, I could see a point of putting a couple of uh, charge points in there. The slight catch there is that it usually costs between five and ten thousand pounds to put an electricity feed into a piece of public property like that. On so the, on the highway, it, yeah. it is yeah. very, very expensive to do. Don't forget that most batteries pull out of the e-bike very easily and you can carry those in to your house, your house or your flat or your office desk or whatever, or your work or your factory bench, whatever and do the charging up away from the bike. I yep. think, however, that car, electric car, electric van charging points, now that is a different matter altogether. Okay, um, we've had a lot of comments about, it's actually about driver behavior. Um, it's the, the issue of, of obviously installing islands, pedestrian crossing islands on roads, um, which is understandable. Um, that, that narrows the, um, the highway 
for um, in, in, in whichever direction and yeah. people experiencing cars um, overtaking more closely at speed um, and then some people driving over the opposite side of the road actually to, to bypass the cyclists and the um, the island so yeah it's the how to yeah educate drivers I guess that's that's uh, well, uh, 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 apart from the glib, there are some drivers who seem immune to being educated. Um, uh, to be fair, first of all, to the driver, especially if it's the first time they've been up that road, did they get any warning that that narrowing of the road was happening? Um, they only really need to be um, uh, doing slightly too fast for the circumstances. You know, let's say they're doing 28 mile an hour. They're not breaking the speed limit, but you know, actually they could have done with being a bit slow. They only need to be doing that and it all becomes quite a mess for that dri driver. So first of all, I do think we need signage. I've got one of these literally 100 meters from my front door and it is a nightmare. The second thing is that um, I think we need some uh, narrowing paintwork <laughs> so that the, the, there's a visual cue saying that this is only room for a bike or a car, not for both. Mm. I think we need a visual cue. Um, but I think the thing that would really sort it out perfectly and would be great for uh, parents with children in buggies, for people with shopping trolleys, for people with uh, walking difficulties, and of course, for um, anybody pushing a bike across the road, is that what you do is you do the whole thing, uh, what the highways people call at grade, and so actually you create a speed hump and um, the walking across the road is level for pedestrians. They get the priority um, and uh, the traffic has to slow down, whether it likes it or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Richard, I think there's, there's a few comments um, on this uh, subject, for, uh, which are actually about <clears throat> how, you, how you deal with I traffic islands that actually um, are meant to make it safer for pedestrians, but perversely do appear quite a lot of examples of people who um, are being squeezed. And I think one, one person particularly has suggested that we need cyclists to cycle more in the middle of the road. So there's no doubt that, that, we, are a that we are a vehicle. That's certainly what I do at Berry Brow. And um, I think, uh, I, I, yeah. And when I, I've got somebody on my tail, <laughs> as, we go, as we go towards it, I actually turn, put my hand out and say, I'm turning right. <laughs> I put my hand out and move out into the middle of the road. Yeah, yeah. I, um, you know, so yes, I agree completely. Can, Lynette, can I just ask Richard one of the questions that came up earlier, um, yeah. which, which is about your example from Groningen. And, uh, uh, you can only answer this briefly, clearly, but Mal Gibb wants to know um, if you get up to 60% of all trips within three kilometres of the centre, sort of what sort of infrastructure and how much did it cost? I mean, you know, that, that could take you all evening. So you've only got two minutes to answer that, but you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. If I only have a short answer, right, uh, £25 per head per year forever. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's my short answer. Um, slightly longer one, um, and, and actually is to just twist it slightly if, if the, the questioner will forgive me. Um, what do they do next is the other bit. <laughs> and the answer is big time. Last year they decided they'd missed cycle logistics and cargo bikes completely. And they've now got a whole new program to do that. So actually, they are ploughing on. They are expecting to be able to improve on that figure. They have invested. They have invested sums. But don't forget, they've got less road maintenance to do because of less traffic. They've got healthier people. They've got people wanting to live there. The economy of a potentially an outlier city within the Netherlands. It's not in the rich, inverted commas, part of the Netherlands. It's up in the north. Actually, it's a really thriving regional economic center. It's got a very large student population now as well. And so these days, it's just, um, it's, it's just a normal part of the council being a success for 
its people and its visitors. And so the cost is whatever it is. They spend less on buses. Okay. Okay, we've got um, Michelle's raised some really valid points um, that people with visual impairments um, have difficulties navigating shared space. Um, so where cyclists and pedestrians are sharing space. Um, and people with mobility difficulties. So an example of that is actually the, the bus islands that we've seen, um, say Oxford Road, where we've actually got um, cyclists between the, the, the pavement and accessing the bus stop. So I know that on Oxford Road, there are um, sort of mini zebra crossings to, to reach those spaces, but often you just have a continuous cycle lane. So have you, have you got any thoughts on, on the design of those spaces, Richard, and how um, how it can be improved for people with visual impairments. Yeah. Um, well, um, for a start off, and this is really difficult territory, and I don't have a magic wand. I'm sorry. I think all parties have got new things to learn, and of course, in the learning phase, you know, things are tricky. Uh, and I, so I don't, I don't have an obvious, you know, trite answer. So the cyclists in Manchester on Oxford Road need to learn that they have to stop at the zebras, mini zebras. And mm. the pedestrians need to learn that they need to look left to make sure they don't get hit. And by the way, because there's a very large student population there, um, I regularly have to do an emergency stop because a student, and it is a student, has stepped into the road with their back to me with their phone, mobile phone glued to their ear mm. and, and, you know, without any looking. And it's because they're from uh, a, ro a country where they drive on the other side of the road. They thought they were looking the right way. <laughs> so, so, so I think both parties need to learn and there needs to be education. When those bus stops were designed, first of all, there were no zebra crossings, but those were introduced after working at the experimental ones. So yeah. the, 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 the reason for that little homily is that the, the issue of visual impairments and what to do so that it is safe, I think we've got new things to learn. If we're gonna do new um, bits and pieces, we, we need everybody to be talking with each other, trying things out, experimenting together. And um, uh, I, I cannot substitute for that. So initially, there's going to be problems early on. I'm sure there are. There are no absolutes here. Don't forget, don't forget that people with visual impairments, sadly, get knocked down on the roads all the time. And, and I lost my own aunt, who was hard of hearing. My auntie Florence stepped into a three-lane road, which was two lanes one way and one lane the other, and looked the wrong way in the middle lane, and she died. So, 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 so these things are awful and we do need to treat them seriously. What I won't have, and there have been some quite extreme positions taken by some people who claim they're representing all people with visual impairments, and I often am troubled by this as to whether that's true. I won't have that shared space can never work any place, any time for anybody who's got visual impairments. I won't have that. I don't think it's true. My perfect example of this is the middle of Leicester. In the middle of Leicester, they've got one of the largest shared space, pedestrian and cyclists spaces in the country. And it is a complete success. And the reason I know it's a full success is because Andy Selkeld and uh, Sir Peter Salisbury, the mayor who put it in, did their maths and homework and consultation and their survey work and their data. And the number of people who are treated as vulnerable road users who use that area after it had been uh, made traffic free is vastly enormously more than we're using it beforehand when there was traffic there. And everybody knows that if they cycle through there, it's at a very slow speed, but it's okay. And I've stood there and I've watched it and it works. So I think there's an education process. There's a design function. I do think that People with visual impairments have serious points to make. I'm not in any way trying to belittle their fears and concerns, right? So there has to be good communication. I do think the highways engineers and planners have got a lot to learn from all parties. Um, 
but I think it's talk, talk, jaw, jaw, not war, war. Can, can okay. I, go on, sorry. No, no, go on, Chaz. I was, I was going to pick you up on, on um, a question or a comment with a question um, that really um, follows on from, the, from what Lynette asked you about the, the merits of, um, of uh, dedicated off-road routes and on-road routes, because this comment says, don't you really need to adopt two approaches to cycling? treating commuting cycling and leisure cycling as, as if um, they're, they're somewhat different. The former are likely to need safe routes and bike storage in the centre, that's commuters. The latter, um, leisure cycling, are likely to need more off-road facilities such as the canal paths, the greenways, and we need to extend that network. So, so um, I'm not saying you're going to disagree with that, but don't we need to make that distinction? Uh, otherwise we have people expecting to be able to cycle on canals to commute and there isn't the, there isn't the room for them on the canals not if you're social distancing well, <laughs> end up in the canal um no i obviously well the the, the 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 obvious thing is that we do need both um the, the question is about priorities and such like um i think sustrans would be the first people to admit that now they know what they know although the national cycle network has been fantastic they are a bit regretful they didn't get into the second bit of the cycling your question has said a bit earlier <laughs> and made some of the national cycle work network more relevant to commuting uh, and in the same time be more stringent that the off-road really was off-road so so uh, it's 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 we're all learning all the time um don't forget if you imagine a cycle returner somebody who knows how to ride a bike but actually that was 40 years ago um uh, the last time they rode a bike. So they're returning to cycling. They definitely need to get their confidence back up on an off-road place, whether it's in the park or on a, a, a row green loop line. So there's a function in terms of increasing cycling rates directly with um, off-road. In terms of on-road, the reason why I think that is a priority at the moment, and I do think it is, is that we can't take away road space from the, tr the cars in queues if we don't also provide appropriate bus services, cycling routes, walking routes at the same time. So there has to be a very careful dance here that we don't actually end up making everybody unhappy by making these changes. And the only way that's going to happen is if the prioritization is quick, and like that, which is why I'm so proud of Salford Council and the fact they've put that serious pop-up bike lane on the right road instantly. And I think they've done a fantastic job there. So I hope that helps. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah so somebody has said that, well, Coldsdale Council have um, put out some consultation on some of these pop-up cycle infrastructure um, and a question about what, what is Kirkley's doing and I think it's I've lost the message now but Rob Walker had said it's uh it's due to the issue here we are got it now uh consultation by Kirkley's council will happen soon it was discussed today um the importance of involvement of different groups of disabled walkers and cyclists so it looks like we can expect something public comment there mm -hmm. um yeah can I just just one small point on that for, for Rob. I've finally found my way into the uh, chat if I am caught up with you. Um, uh, the word consultation and pop-up doesn't work for me. <laughs> because it delays the process, is that what Absolutely. you mean? Absolutely. And, yeah. and what I think we need to do here is we need to use common sense with key people who know what they're doing and put them in and then we consult like, like crazy <laughs> after they've been in a couple of weeks because then we'll very, very quickly find out what is and what isn't working and what mm. is and doesn't have to be man, made, changed or altered. Yeah? And it's not costly infrastructure, is it? So it can be... No. So, yeah. so um, consultation is not... The, it's the old horse and cart, that. Um, mm. They need to just get on with it. Does it need, would need consultation with, it with emergency services? And, no. You no. just get on with it. No, just you can use <laughs> the legislation like that. And by okay. the way, uh, it, there's a long and, and illustrious history of cycling 
uh, facilities being created through that legislation. Cambridge started the ball rolling some years ago when they needed to shut a road in the center of town and they were agonizing about how to do it. So they just went and did it with emergency powers. Then they consulted people and everybody said, yeah, it's great. Why didn't you do it years ago? And it's there today. Mm. Excellent. Um, let's have a look. There's lots of people exchanging ideas on um, where to get cycle training. So that's great. Um, the issue though of, um, yeah, making that transition from, from, for kids learning the skills off road and then transitioning to on road when um, there's not that much space on the roads. Um, yeah, we need to remember who's made this point. Um, Chris, Chris Knight, I think it is. Uh, bear with me. Um, uh, sorry. Making the point that there's um, the more private trips, um, so for leisure and recreation, visiting family, and so on than actual commutes to work. So needing, yeah, I think you'd, you'd mentioned this earlier anyway, Richard, about the investment in safe routes to schools and to the shops um, and so on, not just for work commutes. Um, I guess as well, actually, with the Huddersfield Blueprint, are we actually looking now at having more um, residential, um, people, more people living in Huddersfield Town Centre? Is that something, Chaz, that um, is a, you know, as I suppose shop units empty and there's and there's there's more space for living, so it obviously becomes a more dynamic centre. So rather than it being a destination for work or shopping, it will actually become a, a living space. There, there's certain, there's certainly um, uh, indications that both the council and certainly the civic society favour the idea that um, more of the central area will it over time be residential and not residential student, but residential non-student. Um, and that's, I think that's to do with um, a reshaping of the, of the purposes of the, of the town centre that um, is partly driven by economic change and partly driven by uh, a vision for a, you know, for a, for a, for a different sort of purpose. Uh, and that, that, that certainly underlines the importance of having links, that, uh, cycling links that allow you to cross the town and get out under or the ring road or over mm. on, on, on crossings uh, into the radial routes that will take you to the home, the, the home valley, the Colne Valley, Meltham, Wakefield, Leeds yeah. Road, whatever. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think part of what, what part of what we're looking at and why we invited Richard was, was to say, OK, we have there's all sorts of obstacles to a cycle friendly town, but we have to imagine what we could do in 10 years, not just what we can do in the short term. But I, I like this idea that the pop up um, responses need to be done whilst there is opportunity. If we can't do it now, when can we do it? Yeah. Mm. I have to say that, that, that I've more and more uh, over the years started to just tap into how people feel and think on this that I okay I have some knowledge about the technicals don't I but 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 actually it's 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 looking people in the eye and trying to understand where they're coming from what they do what they choose to do at the moment and why um, and that's just essential I, I, I really am very delighted to be here tonight because um, I see this as absolutely the opposite of a um, uh, macho, aggressive, sadly male-dominated cycling campaign that you can come across here and there. I'm not saying in uh, Huddersfield, John, by the way, <laughs> but but um, uh, I think that I'm encouraged this week enormously because over the last uh, four working days, I've given out 21 e-bikes, <laughs> which is a great thing to be able to give people an e-bike to try for four weeks. We're all NHS staff. Uh, who, let's face it, uh, you know, um, their work environment at the moment is not much fun. And they have, without exception, all of them, and they're from very different parts of the NHS, have been hugely excited. They've been like children at Christmas. And the fact they're going tomorrow to go into our shop and pick up their e-bike for the first time. They have been absolutely, some of them have been 
you know, almost, you know, calm down, dear. You know, they, 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 they needed to just take a breath. But it's interesting to me that we can generate that um, in, in just this simple little way. And we shouldn't underestimate the power of the bike smile. You know, when people get on a bike for the first time in ages and go, God, blimey, that's, that's all right, that, actually. That was good, you know. These are the feelings we've got to rely on. And, and anything we do, I think, has got to be a great experience for the people doing it and looking at it at the time. Uh, can I just pick up on um, a comment that's been made by Councillor Rob Walker, because I think we need to share this, that um, uh, he says that um, Kirkley's council are doing what you've suggested, Richard. Oh, good. Um, well, I don't know the is, detail. No, 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 I'm just, but neither did I, but I'm going to share it. The, the, there is a bid going in for a first tranche of government funding, and it's going in this Thursday, and it does link with the blueprint. And he said the consultation is actually one that's happening in Calderdale, he thinks, not Kirkley's. I certainly <laughs> know, I certainly know that a senior officer asked the cycling campaign, and John Lewis is in the audience, I know, um, for some, for some uh, guidance on the, on the priorities, uh, the quick wins, if you like, that could be included in such a pr proposition. So um, uh, I do think on this occasion, we should, the glass is half full, not half empty. Excellent, good. I, I'm delighted to hear that. <laughs> now we're in the last five minutes, so, yes. so um, yeah, yeah. Lynette, do you have, what do you what do you want to pick up from the comments and questions? Um, I suppose it, quite, yeah, questions about the the emphasis of sort of highway design. Um, let's have a look. Yeah, future proofing, future proofing designs. There's a, there's a comment about. Um, the well comment that the, some of the, the off-road routes have been poorly designed. I suppose now we realise that a two and a half metre wide greenway path is is obviously clearly not wide enough when we're talking about social distancing. So I suppose there's <laughs> could be discussions about re-engineering those, widening those routes. Um, uh, what have we got? Um, Somebody it's, making a comment for in Manchester that a lot of changes were made after the bombing in Manchester um, and they were thought to be impossible at the time. It's a bit radical. We don't want bombing in Huddersfield, but um, I suppose it's, yeah, I suppose it's, there's fear, isn't it, that we're going to miss this opportunity. I mean, I know where I live in the upper Calder Valley in Calderdale. It was blissful the first few days. There was, there was, there was so little traffic and the traffic volumes are just back to where they were. And I think it's a bit, yeah, a bit concerning. People just sort of might go back to... To where we were so we need to try and seize that seize that opportunity of change i mean we've also got um a comment of, of really again about design about whether it really is appropriate to have shared space footpaths um i certainly use shared space footpaths uh quite a bit uh, and it's been quite it's been okay when there haven't been many pedestrians around but it, it is it is, um, I can understand why um, it's been done, but it may be it needs rethinking and, and more of the road space rather than the pedestrian space to be um, taken. But certainly there are quite a few comments we will take up about design. Lynette, what should we do, what should we do to wind up? Well, um, I'd like to just offer a couple of points if I may. Just, just, just. Go on then. So, well, I, I'm particularly picking on Michelle Huff, uh, comments about visual impairment. As somebody uh, who's as blind as a bat without my specs, I do know about visual impairment and my mother's got macular degeneration. So over the last five years, I've had to learn even more about it. Um, I don't want to give any impression that I'm poo-pooing the importance of the issue. Um, but what I do want is to come up with solutions and answers and um, I think those need work. It's as simple as that. Um, I don't think we should underestimate at all the health benefits of more people walking and cycling. Um, and I'll leave you with this little anecdote from Copenhagen where I met the head of logistics at all the Copenhagen hospitals. 
who has switched his Bloods delivery team from diesel vans to cargo bikes. And in so doing, he's got 250 staff in his division. Some of them drive 40 ton trucks with laundry. Um, in so doing this, they, the team of 15 who do all the Bloods deliveries now on cargo bikes, have turned out to have the lowest absenteeism rate of all the teams in this 250 people division. Uh, when I talked to the riders myself, they said one of the biggest impacts for them was the, how less, much less stress there was for them in their job. Because there is nothing more stressful than knowing you've got a vital blood product on board your diesel van, but you're stuck in a traffic queue and can't move. And you're late. And they said they can now set their watches to their bike-driven deliveries. And it's really relieved them of stress and improved their lives beyond recognition. So I, I, I think that there's balance in all things. And um, I, I, I say, I don't want to leave a, any kind of inkling that I don't think this is a serious matter, but we just have to work it out. We have to work at it. I thank you all very much indeed for this opportunity. And uh, on the slides, when they go out there, you will find how to get hold of me if you wish to. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Um, the slides, uh, I'm trying to get the slides uh, fairly quickly onto the, Kirk, onto the um, Huddersfield Civic Society website, uh, certainly over the next couple of days. And I promise to, to, to file the chat and we'll find a way to make that uh, available um, to everybody who wants it. Yeah, maybe and we I've can just, collate some of the key contacts into one yes. space about the sort of training and street bikes and access to bikes. And, and Kirkley's cycling campaign, yeah. who I've just put up on the screen, has its AGM on the 17th of June, I think 7 o'clock or 7.30. And we have a speaker, um, John Little, who is a consultant who worked, I was a prime mover really, on the whole mini Holland scheme in Waltham Forest. And, it's really good value on um, on the experience of um, transforming a, a car-dominated borough to a le lot less car-dominated borough. Um, any last minute? Thank you. Yes, thank you for your comments at the uh, at the this end. It's great. Eight twenty-nine. Um, so thank you, Richard. Thank you, Lynette. Um, this is a groundbreaking event for the civic society and uh, hopefully um it's a um it's a stepping stone towards a more bike friendly town i, I sincerely hope so thank you good luck huddersfield kirk Lees, if you prefer <laughs> thank you richard thank you goodbye uh, I, i'm going to unmute everybody i think if i can remember how to do it <laughs> see what happens <laughs> so if you if you want to speak uh there's 36 people still here i will um i'll do my best to remember how to unmute <laughs> hmm. <sighs> This technology, we're still learning, aren't we? <laughs> I think well, in, the yes. middle of, in the middle of that, what happened? It's not quite seamless, is it? But it's, it's, I, it's I couldn't find my mouse. I couldn't find my um, pointer. You know, it just disappeared completely. And Thank I was whirling around on the trackpad and nothing was happening. <laughs> Thank you, folks. Interesting evening. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank it was you. very inspiring and food for thought. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. That's great. <laughs> so I think you can just, everybody can actually unmute, unmute themselves. Yeah. yeah, I allowed that. I just right. Yeah, I just took it, took it off. Um, okay. Great. Thank you. Anyway, I'm going. Thanks for everything. Okay. So I'll end the recording now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh yeah. Good.